I have a question for you this morning. Uh, this is an important question. It's a question that uh, theologians have debated about, have written about, have excommunicated each other about. It's not a complicated question. Here's the question, are you ready? Are people basically good or basically evil? I know some of you are thinking right now, this is a trick question because nobody is entirely one or entirely the other, right? We are all capable of doing good things, but we all do bad things, either bad that we did on purpose or good that we neglected to do. But I don't mean this to be a trick question. This is not about what any of us do on any given day. It's about how, what we were created to be. And how you answer this question is pretty important because how you answer this question affects your view of the world. Not just your view of creation and the world that God made, but your view of other people and their role in this. I want to give you a little background about how this conversation has played out in the history of Western Christianity. I should warn you, this is something that I am very passionate about and did a lot of research on when I was in seminary. So I have prepared a 60-minute sermon for us today. I'm cutting it back just a little bit. This happened because of a fight between the church in Rome and the Celtic church or the church in Ireland. In the fifth century, Christianity was adopted by the Roman Emperor Constantine, and the church and the state became joined at the hip. As soon as babies were born into Christian families, they were baptized and registered as members of the church and citizens of the state. Many churches, including the Roman Catholic Church, which is the largest group that does this, still practices infant baptism. This practice of infant baptism raised a question for fifth century theologians. If one of the biblical reasons for baptism is the forgiveness of sin, then what sin did these babies commit? That's a fair question. The answer got a little complicated, but here it is in short. Their sin was being born, or actually being conceived because that happened for everyone except for Jesus Christ through a sexual act and because of that we are all born into sin this is the doctrine of original sin now if this doesn't sit quite right with you you're not alone the idea of original sin never really caught on in the Celtic Christianity of Ireland. This is partly because of the Celtic concept of creation and the relationship between creatures and creator. Creation, as God proclaimed in the first chapter of Genesis, was good. And human beings aren't separate from the rest of creation we are a part of that creation. And in fact, we're a very special part of that creation because humans bear the image of God. Now, this doesn't mean that we look like God exactly, but there is some part of us that comes from some part of God. And whatever that part is, it is good. In fact, Celtic Christians and other Christian contemplatives and mystics like St. Francis of Assisi believed that God was revealed in creation, that someone who had never been exposed to the holy writings of the Bible 
could still sense awe and power and reverence in the grandeur and the intimacy of creation. Celtic Christians talked about the big book and the little book. The big book was the work of God written in the work of creation. And the little book was the work of God written in the Holy Scriptures of the Bible. The Bible supports this understanding itself, especially in Romans chapter 1, where God's truth is plain since the creation of the world, and in the creation psalms that we find in the psalms. And as Lisa said, one of my favorites is Psalm 19. I invite you to turn to Psalm 19 if you have a Bible with you. I'm not going to reread it all again, but I'll refer to it. Psalm 19 is a wonderful illustration of the big book and the little book. I especially love verses 3 and 4, which say, there is no speech and no words, and yet somehow the heavens tell the glory of God throughout the world. And through verse 6, the psalmist is talking about the big book, the book of creation. And then in verse 7, the psalmist suddenly changes gears and says, the law of the Lord is perfect. Now we're talking about the little book. For the Hebrew writers of the Psalms, this would have been the Torah, the law. Christians have a slightly bigger little book, which includes not only the prophets and the Psalms, but also the gospel and the letters of the New Testament. Creation gives us the big picture of creator God, and the Bible fills in the details of how we are to live and act in order to honor the image of God within us. The Bible also tells us the story of Jesus Christ, the only human being who perfectly honored the image of God. Speaking of Jesus, I would be remiss if I didn't present the other side of this theological debate about whether people are basically good or basically evil. Here's the downside of all this life is beautiful talk. If people are basically good, then why do we need salvation through Jesus Christ? And if people are basically good, then why is the world such a mess? These are fair questions. No worldview can last very long without acknowledging the reality of evil and pain and suffering. And that, brothers and sisters, is precisely why we need Jesus Christ as our Savior. God's truth is out there, proclaimed to the ends of the earth, through creation in the big book. God's truth is also out there in the little book, and there are people who have committed their lives to taking that book to the end of the earth, too. The problem is that even though that truth is revealed to us, or at least available to us, we often ignore it. Sometimes we intentionally act in ways that are contrary to that truth. Sometimes we intentionally act in ways that are contrary to that truth and blame it on other people. I could go on and on. I won't. I trust it's enough to say that despite the image of God within us, what I believe to be the deepest core of who we are we are constantly going off the path of God's law. And we can't get back on track by ourselves. It's only through the grace and salvation of Jesus Christ that we can stay on the path of God's will for us. I heard an interview this week with Cheryl Sandberg. She's the CEO of Facebook. 
Some of you may have read her first book, which was called Lean In. She was being interviewed about her second book, which is called Option B. And this book arises out of an experience that she had a couple of years ago. She was on vacation with her husband and young children in Mexico. And her husband, Dave Goldberg, who was 47 years old at the time, got on a treadmill at their exclusive resort and had a fatal heart attack. That experience of losing a spouse and having your world turned upside down is something that I know resonates with some of you. If you have not had your world upended by suffering or pain, you surely know someone who has. How can we possibly acknowledge, let alone proclaim, Christ's salvation in the presence of evil and suffering? Option B is not a Christian book, but Sandberg offered some wisdom that I'd like to share with you. First of all, resilience, that is the ability to become strong, healthy, and successful after something bad has happened. Resilience is not something that we either have or we don't. Turns out that resilience can be cultivated. We can practice re resilience, like physical recovery, from an injury or a surgery, we can strengthen our emotional and spiritual resilience over time. Do you know what builds spiritual resilience? What's that emotional bicep curl that we can do? Gratitude. Gratitude. It may sound ridiculous, to be grateful when your world has fallen apart. But here was Sandberg's example. A year after her husband's death, she was talking to a friend who said, what can you be grateful for in this experience? And her response was, are you kidding me? My husband died suddenly of a heart attack. What could I possibly be grateful for? And her friend said, you could have been driving a car with your children in it at the time. And knowing that her children were safe and well changed Sandberg's perspective a little bit on that experience. It allowed her to see a bigger picture. Which leads to her second point. Be grateful for the small stuff. There may be big realities in our lives which we cannot change. The death of a spouse, a serious illness, a bad financial situation. We can't wait for those things to be fixed before we practice gratitude because there are some things which cannot be fixed. we can still notice and give thanks for the little things. There is a crab apple tree out here at the end of the driveway. I probably passed it a dozen times on my way to and from the office last week. It is the most beautiful tree that I saw out driving around this week. A good night's sleep the Easter cards that were in my Creekside mailbox. All of these small things add up to a big thing. When we share gratitude for little things, it adds up. When we share our gratitude with other people, it multiplies. When we share our gratitude for God, it's called praise. And praise is a powerful thing. 
We don't praise God because life is easy. We praise God because life is difficult and God never leaves us alone and God never stops loving us. We praise God because sometimes we do things that make our lives even more difficult and when we really messed up, God sent his son Jesus Christ to save us. Even when life is difficult, the crab apple tree blossoms and spring comes and God gives us the gift of every day. God the creator is the author of the big book, the book of creation, which reveals God's glory and power. God is also the author of the little book, the Bible, which reveals God's truth and the truth about ourselves and the truth about our need for Jesus Christ and Christ's grace and salvation. All praise be to God, the Creator, Christ, the Redeemer, and the Spirit who is at work among us. Hallelujah. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.